I hope you're ready for more parables. We are in the Gospel of Matthew looking at the teaching of Jesus, and we're in the section where Jesus shifts his mode of teaching to the parable, the story. And from the middle of the Gospel of Matthew to the end, that's Jesus' principal teaching method. It's not that he invented the form. Parables were around before the New Testament period. There are parables in the Old Testament. There are parables in the secular world. Uh, the boy who cried wolf is a secular parable. Uh, it's not meant to have a religious meaning, but it still conveys truth through that story form. Uh, some texts would say uh, the tortoise and the hare is an example, but tortoise and the hare is really a fable. The difference between a parable and a fable is that fables use animals as the principal characters, and parables don't. Parables use people. But there were parables in the secular world. There were parables in the Old Testament. You remember when Nathan came to David after his great sin with Bathsheba? And Nathan said, I have a story for you about a man who was wealthy, but when friends came to call and he had to serve a nice dinner, he stole the only lamb from a poor man. And David was furious until Nathan said, you're the man. It's a parable. Uh, Jesus didn't invent the parable, but he perfected it. And he brought it to its uh, full potential as a teaching tool in the New Testament. Of the 40 or so full parables of Jesus, we're not counting now the word pictures like you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world. But of the 40 full parables of Jesus, 20 of them are in Matthew. And several of them are in this chapter, where we are today, in Matthew chapter 13. We've covered two parables so far. We won't cover all 40. Uh, we don't have time for that. You can catch that in your personal Bible study. But um, we've covered the parable of the two houses, one built on sand, one built on the rock, that was in the Sermon on the Mount. And then last week we covered the parable of the sower and the seed uh, that Jesus introduces here in the first part of Matthew chapter 13. Picking up where we left off there, we notice right away that Jesus, in telling the parables that follow, introduces them with a new phrase. And the new phrase is, the kingdom of heaven is like. Parables come from a root word that means to lay something alongside. You see how that would fit the purpose of a parable. Here's a story alongside the truth to help you understand the truth. Uh, to lay something alongside is the very purpose of a parable. So when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like, it's a perfect introduction for that. Matthew's theme all through his book is the kingdom of God. He mentions it over 50 times in his book. Uh, and, and which came first, chicken or the egg? Did, did, did Matthew tune into the parables of the kingdom because he had that theme in mind? Or I think more likely, he wrote his book with that theme in mind because he was saturated with the parables of the kingdom that God had uh, imprinted on his mind through these teachings of Jesus. Although we use the phrase kingdom of God, Matthew prefers the king kingdom of heaven. He doesn't use it every time, but most of the time he does. So why? Uh, the reason for that is that the gospel of Matthew was written primarily for Jewish readers. In the early days, the church was made up primarily of the Jewish community. Jesus was Jewish. His disciples, his apostles, were Jewish. The scriptures for them, the Bible, was the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures. Uh, the church was born out of a Jewish festival after the resurrection of Jesus, the festival of Pentecost. And so the beginning of the gospel, the beginning of the truth of God expressed through his church is found there. Uh, the, the 
the Jewish context is essential to understanding the birth and the growth of the gospel. So it's not surprising then that Jewish readers might be high on the list of those that the gospel writers want to reach. And Matthew is the prime example of that. How do we know for sure? Well, there's several reasons. Uh, there are more Old Testament quotations in Matthew, more Old Testament references that aren't full quotations even in Matthew than in any other New Testament book. Whenever Matthew mentions a Jewish custom, he doesn't stop to explain it. Now Mark does. If you read Mark's gospel, he'll say, Jesus did this at a Jewish festival and the reason was, or the purpose of the festival, or the pattern of behavior uh, that you need to understand is this, because Mark was writing primarily to Gentile readers. Specifically, it appears, the church at Rome. And so Mark would take the time to briefly explain a Jewish custom. Matthew never does. Matthew assumes the readers will understand. When Matthew gives us Jesus' family tree, he starts with Abraham, father of the Jews. Now Luke gives us Jesus' family tree, and he starts with Adam. Maybe the most important clue is actually in this phrase, kingdom of heaven. Because there is in the Jewish custom a hesitancy to speak God's name because it's too holy. Still true today. Um, we have a, a, a carryover of that custom in our scripture, in our New Testament, when we have the word Lord in all caps. It's not the Hebrew word for Lord. Hebrew word for Lord is Adonai, and sometimes that's used in the New Testament, but it's never spelled in all caps. When Lord is in all caps, it's Yahweh. It's God's name. And so uh, the Jewish custom was to substitute the Lord for God's name because it was too holy to pronounce. In this case, the substitution is not Lord. The substitution is heaven. So the kingdom of God becomes the kingdom of heaven. So parable after parable now will begin. The kingdom of heaven is like. We'll look at two of those parables today. Now our quarterly only has one. Quarterly has the parable of the wheat and the weeds. But later in chapter 13, there is a parallel parable. There's a parable that tells this, that has the same point to it. And that's the parable of the net. Um, it's actually at the end of the chapter. We're going to pull it forward and talk about it today in the context of the wheat and the weeds because they both teach the same truth. Let's start with the wheat and the weeds. Uh, if you have your quarterly, Matthew 13, 24 is our first verse. You can follow in your scripture if you don't. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. This follows hard on the heels of the parable of the sower that we looked at last Sunday. Parable of the sower is about different soils. This parable is about different seeds. And in fact, about different sowers. Matthew 13 project that Alive offers to new converts is based on the parable of the sower. It talks about being rooted and grounded in the faith. Well, Jesus now is moving just a half step from that and is giving us another parable, another word lesson about a farmer and his seed. But this one's a very different lesson. So the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. In the King James Version, these weeds are called tares, T-A-R-E-S. You may be familiar with the, the phrase, and the parable is sometimes called the parable of the wheat and the tares. Ben Witherington, great teacher at Asbury Seminary, likes to say, this is a terrible parable. 
and you thought my jokes were bad. <laughs> Historians have discovered that the Jews actually had, uh, uh, not the Jews, the Romans, actually had a law against this very thing, against sowing bad seed in someone else's field, which just reinforces for us that this was really a thing. And Jesus wasn't using a hypothetical. This is a real problem in that day, and he uses it to make a point. Uh, sowing any kind of weeds would be a mean prank to play, but this one goes much deeper than that because these tares, uh, agriculturalists today call them bearded darnel. That's the phrase for the modern, modern phrase for the plant are actually poisonous. And so if they are mixed with the wheat, there's a real danger involved there. This, this was a really wicked act by the enemy. Verse 26, when the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this. He replied. Jesus later identifies the enemy. Now, remember, this is an early parable of Jesus. His disciples are still asking, now, walk us through that again. Unpack that for us. And so he does. He'll stop doing that soon. And most of the rest of his parables are without explanation. But when he gives them the explanation for this one, he says the enemy's the devil. The devil's work, though, is not the focus of the parable. The parable is not about how evil the devil is. The focus of the parable is about God's timetable for dealing with it. The devout in Israel had no problem believing in a kingdom of heaven. They had no problem believing in a Messiah who would introduce the kingdom of heaven. They were prepared for that by the Old Testament, the way God had laid the foundation. Or how about this? God had sown the seed in the Old Testament, and they recognized it, and they were aware of it, and they were looking for Messiah. And then Jesus came, and John the Baptist said, here's the Messiah. And Jesus' miracles gave credence to that and supported that claim. So, if Messiah has been promised and Messiah is now here and the kingdom of heaven is at hand, meaning present, observable, why is there still evil in the world? That's what they were wondering. Shouldn't evil be gone now? Shouldn't God, isn't this the way God was going to take care of the devil's work in the world. The Romans are still here. They haven't packed up and left. The Herods are still here, figurehead rulers under the Romans with the same genes as Herod the Great. John the Baptist, in fact, is at jail, in jail at this time because he's preached against one of the Herods, Herod Antipas, who married his niece after stealing her away from, are you ready for this? His brother, who had married that niece of both of them previously. And if you remember the story, Herod Antipas then begins to lust after his great niece when she does a dance of the seven veils kind of thing uh, at the time of, of John the Baptist's execution and said, this is what this is what I want in return for pleasing you. I want the head of John the Baptist on a plate. Those are the Herods. They're still here. They're not even Jewish. They're Edomites or Idumeans. If, if Messiah is here to set things right, why are the Herods still here? There are still unjust judges on the benches. There are still unscrupulous merchants in the stores. Sin is apparent all around. And yet you say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. How could that be? 
The problem was in their theology. They believed Messiah's coming would set everything right. Messiah would be the righteous judge. He will judge evil. He will reward faithfulness. And because they were the faithful, rewards would come their way. And that's why on Palm Sunday, when Jesus entered the city, they shouted, Hosanna. Here he comes. He's coming in and Rome's going out. And when on Friday, it was a Roman governor who said, I wonder what I should do with this Jewish Messiah. They said, crucify him. He obviously isn't the one we're waiting for. If he's now a victim of Roman rule, just like we are. What they fail to understand is that, as theologians say today, the kingdom of heaven is both already and not yet. It has begun. It's not complete. Jesus has two comings associated with the kingdom of heaven, not just one. And the first coming is to save. The second is to judge. Think about it. If Jesus had come as judge the first time, we'd all be lost because there'd be no Calvary. But he came to save first. And then when he returns, he'll come to judge. Picking up our reading in the middle of, of verse 28, let's go back to the parable. The servants ask him, the owner of the field, do you want us to go and pull up the weeds? No, he answered, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Now, this, this makes this uh, evil trick even more insidious because Darnell and wheat look similar in their growing stages. It'd be hard to separate them. It would be hard to distinguish between them. When they come to full growth, they're easy to distinguish, but not while they're growing, not during the growing stages. Also, the roots tend to intertwine. And so the farmer said, I don't want you going through the field trying to pick out the weeds because you'll make two mistakes you'll miss some weeds because they look an awful lot like wheat and you'll pull up some wheat because they look an awful lot like weeds. So wait until the harvest. Next verse. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned and then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. The harvest. And the harvest is not yet. It's still the growing season. The harvest, the emphasis is on waiting for a harvest in the future. That's what Jesus is saying. That's when the good will be separated from the bad, but not till then, not entirely. At the harvest, it will be easy to tell them apart. Jesus said, when he was explaining the parable to his disciples, he said, the field is the world. So we need to start with a broad picture of evil in the world. But then he goes on to tell about a plant that looks so much like the real thing, it's hard to tell them apart. That's not just everyday evil, is it? That's not just everyday wickedness. That's easy to tell apart. This is a message not just for the world, it's a message for the church. Because the church is the place where sometimes there is uh, the wearing of masks, there's pretense, there's impersonation, there's, there's pretending to be something that we aren't. The, the world doesn't, I mean the world may do that, but they don't, they're not imitating Christ, they're imitating other things. They're not imitating Christians, they're imitating other things. And it's, it's in the church that it may be difficult to tell who really belongs to God and who really doesn't. I mean, even the 12 
had a traitor among them. So you know, there's no such thing as a perfect church. Somebody has said, if you ever find a perfect church, don't join it. It won't be perfect anymore <laughs> when you do. And so uh, uh, Jesus is, is giving a message, not just for the world here. He's giving a message for the church. I'm very glad it's not my job. I'm very glad it's not your job to figure out who really is or who really isn't God's in the church or the world. Now, uh, sometimes it's obvious, and the scripture tells us to take action. Like uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians says, this man who's living in open sin with his stepmother, that's not good for the church, and it's not good for him. You need to wake him up with church discipline. You need to call his hand so that then perhaps he'll be alert to and aware of and open to the moving of the Spirit and repent. Uh, so it's, it's not that the, the Bible says, well, just if anybody claims it, then you have to treat them as if that's sincere. There are some cases where it's obviously not. But that's very different from setting ourselves up as a tribunal, as anointing ourselves as judges to try to figure out who is and who isn't God's. We'll do the same thing the farmhands would have done. We'll miss some who are really good fakers and we're liable to uproot some real wheat because it doesn't look the way we think it ought to look. People are so different. People express their faith in such different ways. People are at such different levels of spiritual maturity. We can't read their hearts, but God can. And you've heard me tell a story before, but uh, C.S. Lewis was walking out of church with a friend one day and the friend said, that grumpy old woman we just met, surely she's not a believer. And Lewis said, oh, yes, she is. You should have seen her before. <laughs> God knows. God knows. We don't. I'm happy to leave the sorting to him. One of the ways that the church is described in theology is the church visible and the church invisible. And what's meant by that? Well, the church visible is all of those who identify as Christians, all of those who say, I am a believer. Do you know that's about one third of the world's population? About one third of the world's population identifies as Christian. That's the church visible. You can see their names on the roll. You can see their faces when they come to church. What about the church invisible? Those are the ones God knows. Those are the ones who are real. And you and I can't see that heart, but he does. So the bottom line is wait till the harvest. At judgment day, it'll be clear. And Jesus, to make that point even stronger, tells a second parable later in the chapter with the same point. It's the parable of the net or the dragnet. It's actually a part of next Sunday's lesson. I'm stealing it out of the text for next Sunday's lesson to look at it early because it reinforces this message, the message of the wheat and the weeds. Uh, Matthew 13, 47. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore and then they sat down and collected the good fish into baskets, threw the bad away. The um, Jewish kosher code allowed some kinds of fish on their diet, but not all kinds of seafood. Uh, this is how it will be at the end of the age. A dragnet. Now, for some of us of a certain age, dragnet suggests one of the great TV police dramas of all time, right? <laughs> Joe Friday and Just the Facts, ma'am, that kind of thing. But originally, dragnet comes from the vocabulary of fishermen. And some of you have perhaps fished this way. But a boat will pull a net behind it through the water. Sometimes the net's called a seine. And collect all the fish that it can, bring it up onto the dock, and there it's sorted out. There's where you sort out the fish you're going to keep from the ones you're not. 
and there's where you throw the old shoes and the plastic trash and everything else somewhere else, not back in the lake, I hope. Uh, but that, that sorting doesn't happen in the water. That sorting happens on the dock. Nobody's going to jump in the water and try to shoo the bad fish away and let the good fish come into the net. You don't do that. Again, you wait until the harvest, in this case, the harvest of fish. And then it's easy to tell them apart when the net's brought up on the dock. I will say this, I have to disagree with the writer of our lesson here in one, on one thing. He or she says these parables mean that we shouldn't take action against evil in our world, but leave that to God. Uh, the quote is, just wait for him and his plan. He'll take care of it. I don't think that's what the parable says. John Wesley didn't think that's what the parable said. He opposed the evil in his world. The early Wesleyans, who were abolitionists, didn't think that's what the scripture said. They opposed the evil in their world because they were representing Christ. This is not about evil in general. This is, these, this is about people. It's about judging people. We ought to fight evil when we can it's just that we aren't a judge of individuals' relationship with God. Only he sees that heart. And so, here in Matthew 13, we have a pair of parables. A pair of parables? Huh? If, if, if that's pretty bad, I know. If Witherington can do it, I can do it too. This is a pair of parables. And Jesus liked to do that. He'll, he'll, we'll see him continue to do that. He gives us a pair of parables on the value of the kingdom because we'll be looking at um, the treasure hidden in a field and the pearl of great price. They're both about how valuable the kingdom of God is. He gives us a pair of parables about small th uh, uh, things that begin small and grow great, like um, the mustard seed and the yeast in the bread. That's a pair of parables. He gives us a pair of parables in Luke about persistence in prayer. Uh, the friend who comes at midnight and wakes up a friend and says, please help me, and bugs him until he does. Uh, and the parable of the unjust judge who finally gives the widow a righteous verdict because she won't stop asking. Even more emphatically, Luke records three parables on lostness, right? The lost sheep the lost coin, and the lost son, or we would say the prodigal son. Powerful repetition. Now, the repetition is not in the story. The stories are all different. The repetition is in the point that the stories make, and Jesus reinforces that each time. It's the work of a master teacher because it's the work of the master. Let's pray together. Lord, we're so grateful that though we weren't there 2,000 years ago when you shared this with those first disciples, you share them with us through the scripture. And the Holy Spirit is here to do what you did for them. Help us understand. Help us get to the point. Help us to discover the truth in these stories. May they not just be stories to us, Lord. May they shape and mold us. May we be more consecrated and dedicated to the service that you called us to because we're walking in the pattern that you've laid out, sometimes in plain language, sometimes in story form, all through these Gospels. In Jesus' name, amen.